to lesson 44, the forgiveness of sins. We're going to start with a story from the scriptures. You have that little picture there, which helps you to um, remember the, the main thing. Um, you see the public and private, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector depicted there on your screen for you. The account reads like this. Jesus told this parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So when we examine the words of this parable, uh, just a reminder that parable are stories that Jesus told to convey a spiritual truth. Why did the Pharisee think God would be pleased with him? When we look at his response, we see that everything that he does is point to himself. He says, I give a tenth of my income. I fast twice a week. I am not like all these other people. So everything that he says is based on himself. God inspired King Solomon, the wisest man in the world, to write a book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. And in this book, we get Solomon's reflections. Here's one. There is surely not a righteous man on earth who does good and does not sin. If you look at question two in your workbook, it asks you to evaluate the statement, the tax collector understood this passage, but the Pharisee did not. You have to agree with that. The tax collector understood that he was not righteous. But the Pharisee didn't get it. He thought that he was doing a pretty good job. He thought that if he compared himself to other people, he could see that he was better than others. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, we see who we have to look to when it comes to our salvation. In him, we also have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in keeping with the riches of his grace. What does it mean that we have redemption through Jesus' blood? It means that Jesus paid with his blood to buy us back from the power of the devil. By, and the, the price was his blood, was his life. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 tells us, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we get this completely unfair trade that we can be so happy about. And that unfair trade is this. The guilt of our sin was given to Jesus, and the righteousness of Jesus was given to you and I. The Great Exchange, this is a, a drawing, something that I'd like you to understand and be able to do on your own. So I'm going to try to draw this here for you. So first we've got this cross and this cross represents Jesus. Now we know two very important things about Jesus. We know first of all that he is good, um, that he's righteous. So we're going to give him a plus sign and plus righteous. And then we also know that he doesn't have something. He doesn't have or he's without sin. Now let's think about you and me. I'm going to depict us with a little stick man here. We're the opposite of this, aren't we? We have sinfulness and we lack righteousness. So the Great Exchange tells us this, that Jesus gave us his righteousness and his sinlessness and he took from us our sin and our lack of righteousness, he suffered the punishment that we deserve. There you have that great exchange. 
that Jesus, with his righteousness and lack of sin, gave us that in exchange for our sin and our lack of righteousness. Our first main point is that God declares that all people are righteous through Jesus' sacrifice. This story is just awesome. I'll try to paint the picture for you. So Jesus comes to this town, and at this time in his ministry, he was incredibly popular. People wanted to hear his message. So he goes to a home, and this house is packed with people. Now, there are people who are trying to bring their paralyzed friend to him, but they can't get their friend to him. So they have to actually lower him down into the house. When Jesus sees their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now the experts of the law who are gathered there say to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. He's claiming to do something that only God can. Jesus knew their thoughts and he said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your stretcher and go home. Then the man got up and went home. So when we think of this, what's important to understand is what Jesus said was something that the people couldn't prove. They couldn't say that we see your authority to forgive sins. But they could very plainly see if a paralyzed man could get up and walk. So when Jesus said that, if the man didn't get up and walk, the people could rightfully say, you're a fraud. You can't do anything. But when he said that, that confirmed the power that he had. We're going to use that to answer question number seven in your workbooks. It says, he also heard the message that his sins were forgiven. Evaluate this statement. The paralytic is a perfect example to illustrate that forgiveness is a free gift. He couldn't do anything to earn forgiveness. It's true, 100% true. Think of this man, he was paralyzed. He literally couldn't do anything for himself, but he was a sinner. Jesus forgave his sins, not because of anything he did, but it was a free gift. We're gonna go through a set of passages here and list reasons why we can't do anything to earn forgiveness. Romans 7 verse 18 says, Indeed, I know that good does not live in me, that is in my sinful flesh. The desire to do good is present with me, but I am not able to carry it out. You see the elephant in that picture in the background? That elephant is struggling to get up that mountain. That's us. We can't get up that mountain because... Nothing. I know that good does not live in me. It doesn't live in me. I am unable to carry it out. So we can't on our own do anything. Romans 8 verse 7, for the mindset of the sinful flesh is hostile to God, since it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. That tells us that the sinful flesh is hostile to God. It can't submit to God's law. And Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked when you followed the ways of this present world, you were following the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now at work in the people who disobey. That tells us that we were dead. We couldn't do anything. We were following the ruler of the domain of the air. That's talking about Satan. So by nature, we were spiritually dead. Romans 8 verse one informs us of a beautiful reality. So then there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ has freed us from guilt and punishment that we deserve because of our sins. 
And finally, this beautiful passage that you know so well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What proof do you see that God gives all of us forgiveness as a free gift? Notice the word, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, that word whoever believes in him. There's no conditions, no obligations to me. Main point, God offers forgiveness of sins through the gospel. We read this parable. We're going to dig into it a little bit more. What's the difference between the prayer of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Why didn't the Pharisee ask God for mercy and forgiveness? He didn't think he had to. He thought that he was righteous and good enough on his own. The tax collector prayed that God would have mercy on me. Why was his prayer different? Because the tax collector was aware of his own sinfulness. He understood that he needed a savior. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3 says, Therefore I am informing you that no one speaking by God's Spirit says, A curse be upon Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Number 13 in your workbook asks us to evaluate this statement. Our sinful nature is like the Pharisee and not the tax collector. That's 100% correct. Our sinful nature wants us to believe that we can earn eternal life. It is stubborn and refuses to acknowledge that we need Jesus. We receive forgiveness through faith in God's promises that he has forgiven us. By nature, we don't believe. How then can we have faith? It's a gift of God. Roman, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift that has been given to us by God. Our second main point and our final main point for this lesson, the Holy Spirit gives us faith to believe the gospel.